Well, good morning, church. Happy Sunday morning. Happy Palm Sunday. I'm glad we're here together. Together. We get to be together this morning. This is my house. Well, it's a part of my house. You see, you see the clean part right now, which is nice. My kids are watching SpongeBob or on Instagram, and Sarah's keeping the dog quiet. So we'll see how this goes this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for gathering online. This whole situation we're in right now is truly bizarre. The constant word that keeps on coming through my head, other than social distancing, is just weird. This is a weird time. And I've never done anything quite like this. Our church has never had this. One time during Hurricane Irma, Pastor Tony did a brief church from his living room. And now here we are planning it on purpose. We heard about this on Wednesday, that we're going to have a shelter in place order for all of our area, all, all of Florida. So now we're doing this all from different parts. And I'm so glad that we get to be together on Palm Sunday because here's what I believe. I believe that Satan intended this for evil, but God is intending it for good. When we were looking at some of the statistics from our online services the last couple of weeks, it's been interesting to see how we've had, last Sunday's sermon I think had 6,000 different touch points between the different social media platforms and whatnot. So if we normally reach five to 600 people on a Sunday and Satan says, we, we got to shut that down. And now God says, no, no, here's what we're going to do. We're going to reach 6,000 people. I don't know what God's up to, but I know that his plans are always better than ours. We're going to get into the reality that this is, this is a frustrating time to be a person of faith, but it's also a beautiful time to be a person of faith because you think, how is God doing this? But also, I believe that God has a reason for allowing this to happen. So we're going to dig into some of that. But for now, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a church that cares about people and that gathers on Sunday mornings like this. It is Palm Sunday. It is a week before Easter. And this is a sacred time. This is the beginning of a sacred week in the church. And we're glad to be about it. You know, the time we're living in is similar to that because this is one of those generation-defining moments that we get to be in the middle of. A lot of those moments are a one-day hit, but sometimes they get dragged out into, we don't know how long this one's going to be. And every generation has their version of, I remember where I was when, you know, for my grandparents, it was World War II. And my grandpa couldn't go to World War II because he had scarlet fever. The other one ended up in Germany. Uh, for my parents, it was, and for a lot of you, it was a Kennedy assassination. And you remember where you were when that happened or landing on the moon. And when I was a kid, this might date me a little bit, but when I was in first grade, I remember the Challenger explosion. We used to, you know, you see the shuttle take off and then we'd all run outside at Northport Elementary School, shout out. And then we, uh, we, we saw the shuttle going up and then you saw a little puff from Northport. But then you run back inside, you look at the TV. I remember it. And 20 years later, 9-11 happens. I was a senior in college trying to process what, what is going on. I remember Sarah's father or grandfather had passed away the night before. And we're trying to figure out what, what's happening on TV. And it looked like a bad skit with bad graphics. And then you realize this is on every channel. Life before 9-11 and after 9-11 was very different we're still living in a lot of those ripple effects. And then this, 2020 is gonna be remembered for what we're going through. And you and I have the opportunity now to write the story that we tell later. So what's that story gonna look like? You know, we have not just culturally defining moments, they're, they're personally defining moments that you know, May 6, 2000 probably doesn't affect you very much at all, except for one other person. And that's my wife, because that's when we got married, which means next month is 20 years. So I better figure out what I'm doing. But that was a big deal for us. Life before that and life after that are very different. When we graduated high school, 
there, it's sad, this whole experience for those who are graduating college, graduating high school, their last semester has been stripped away from them and it's, it's hard to watch. And in some ways this will be much more memorable than the normal year of senior year. But that, you spend 13 years in school in that fish, fish bowl of life and then life after that, very different, right? Palm Sunday begins a very different experience for all of culture because this week is going to be the dividing point for eternity, for the way we interpret history. And people can call it BCE and CE all they want, but the reality is that split between BC and AD comes with Jesus. And the point at which Jesus dies on the cross, everything about history changes. It's a culmination of everything that came in the Old Testament, everything that's coming. He's entering into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So if you have your Bibles, you're sitting on your couch, you are sitting, I don't know where else you'd be, in your car, maybe, wherever you're at, open up your Bibles, Matthew chapter 21. You know, 35% of the Gospels has to do with this last week of Jesus' life. And we're, just, we're going to take the one out of Matthew, and we're going to go with the rest. But the thing I want you to remember out of this is Jesus has come to save. Jesus has come to save. A week before he enters into Jerusalem, he raises Lazarus from the dead. Remember those stories all throughout the New Testament? He's been doing these stories where he says, hey, now don't tell anybody. He's avoiding large crowds. He's going off by himself. And then you see a shift. When he raises Lazarus from the dead, he does it in front of everybody. And there's this, it's always been an interesting thing to me. There's that part of the story of Lazarus where it says, and many who witnessed believed. Many. There are people who saw Lazarus get raised from the dead and are like, nah, I don't think so. I don't think I can buy it. That, that's a thing that happened. Many who believed. It should say all who saw this believed. It doesn't. So if you're thinking, if I could just have seen it, then I would believe. It takes faith. A week later, after raising Lazarus from the dead, chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mountain of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. Now, we're going to see where he sends the disciples. But it's important to know what's happening at this gate that he's entering into. This is a, there's several ways to get into the city. And he chose the gate by the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is going to be really important later on this week in Jesus's life. But there's actually a prophecy. There's so many prophecies being fulfilled over and over again. In Ezekiel chapter 10, there's a prophecy saying that Jesus is going to go in, or the Savior is going to go in through this gate. So even little moments like that, prophecy is being fulfilled. What was spoken of hundreds of years earlier is coming to pass in this moment. And then he sends these two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Which by the way, can we just stop there? That's a weird story. It's a weird thing to say, and only God can get away with this, to say, in, in the, you, okay, I need you to go into the city. Now, when you get there, there's going to be a donkey and the donkey's donkey child, which is called a, a foal. And the foal and the donkey are going to be there. I want you to untie them, bring them to me. And before they can say, hey, isn't somebody going to say, hey, that's my donkey? He goes ahead and jumps out ahead of their argument and says, don't worry. If somebody asks why you're taking their donkey, just say the Lord needs it. And then keep on walking and they'll be fine with it. Just them going into the city is such a step of faith. But they've seen God do so, Jesus do so many other things up at this point. I guess it seems reasonable. Why wouldn't he be able to have a donkey waiting in the city and a baby child donkey waiting with her. 
and they go in and you know what, there it is. This would be like somebody saying, hey, you, you, you see somebody walking into your, uh, into your driveway and starting up your car, like, hey, that's my car, what are you doing? And they say, oh, the Lord needs it. Ah, okay, go ahead. I, I wouldn't let somebody take my car. I wouldn't let somebody take my donkey if I had a donkey. So what are the chances this is gonna work? Really, really good if you're Jesus. This took place to fulfill, in verse four, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. This is a prophecy from Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine. So much prophecy is being fulfilled. It was prophesied that the Savior would come into the city on a donkey. Not just a donkey, but a colt, the foal of a donkey. This donkey has never been ridden before. Donkeys who are experienced are quite stubborn, I'm told. I've never ridden a donkey before, but I'm told they're quite stubborn. And this donkey has never been ridden before. You don't just hop on. If you, if you want to, well, you can't try it this week because you're not allowed to leave the house. If you could, you would get on a donkey and you would realize this is uncomfortable at best. And if you jump on a, a child donkey, then you'd realize this is impossible because you would be on the ground shortly. But not with Jesus. With Jesus, the natural world obeys Jesus. The natural world stays put. When Jesus says, stay there, I have some disciples coming for you. The natural world allows a stranger to walk the donkey and the donkey's mom out to Jesus. They put some cloaks on the donkeys and Jesus walks off. Can I just encourage you? The natural world pays attention to Jesus. The natural world does what Jesus says to do. The natural world still obeys what Jesus says. I'm not totally comfortable with the fact that that's true, but also what's happening right now that keeps me preaching from my living room is happening. That there can be a virus going into humans, but I know that God is going to redeem this for his glory. There's going to be people that because of the way God is maneuvering the natural world who have a story on the other side of this moment that says, I got saved because of what God did in my life through the coronavirus. He will redeem this. Eternally, this will show the glory of God, even if temporally, it's hard to see. That's true of all of our lives. That's not new news in the last month, but it's especially important now. It's a prophecy that's being fulfilled the king comes in on a donkey. This used to happen in ancient Rome. You know, it says in Revelation that Jesus is going to ride in on, this, on a white stallion, and that will happen someday. But there's something powerful about the humility of coming in on a donkey, but the power of being able to make the donkey do it. Humility and power is the balance that we love. It's what you need in the Savior. I need to know that you're powerful enough to do anything, but humble of heart enough to know that you're not going to abuse that power. Being a king is the most efficient form of government. You could just do whatever you want. People have to do it. But it's the most dangerous because that kind of power corrupts. You know, absolutely. That's the, that's the whole reality of human existence. That power corrupts unless you're Jesus. And then it's the best case scenario because we really do know that our Father knows what's best for us, and He really is in control. So even when we can't understand, we can still trust. We can still love. We can still hope. The things we've been talking about this last week. What the disciples do? Verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and colt and put, them on, put on them their cloaks, and He sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Palm Sunday. This is where it comes from. 
They trim palm branches off and they wave them as Jesus walked by. They wave their palm branches at Jesus. Palm branches are a symbol of the nation of Israel. They're everywhere. Dates grow off of these palm branches. And so it's a source of life. And so when they trim these palm branches and they wave them, it's waving, we identify with your chosen people. And they're waving them in front of, in front of Jesus. And this, this even goes back to, if you look in the book of Leviticus, it talks about the, the Feast of Tabernacles. This was to honor the moment where they were leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land. And while they're in the process, they had to go through the wilderness and they had to camp out for years and years. And God didn't want them to forget that. So he said, I want you to go camp out with your family. And what you would do to camp out, you'd make a little lean-to tent out of palm branches. And so as you laid there at night, you would look at these palm branches, remembering how God brought you out of slavery and into the promised land. You no longer have to be a slave, but you get to be free in the name of God. And now they're waving these palm branches in front of the one who takes away our slavery to sin. And he brings us into the freedom of the kingdom of God. That's the story. The palm branches are proclaiming the gospel. Even in that moment, they don't even realize how much is proclaiming the gospel because he's on his way. He's a week away from rising from the dead. And they have no idea. In verse 9, and the crowds went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is a quote from Psalm 118. See, Psalm 113 to 115 speaks about the past of the history of Israel and Egypt. Psalm 116 and 117 speaks of the present, of the moment when those psalms are being written. But Psalm 118 speaks of the future, how there's going to be a day when the son of David takes the throne and these people recognize Jesus, you are the savior. You're the one who's come to save us. Hosanna. The word Hosanna means save us. We pray, save us now. And here he is to save them. And you might be thinking to yourself, like you may have read ahead. You may have heard this story once or twice. You may be thinking, so how did they go from, Hosanna in the highest to, you know, this many days later, crucify him. How do you do that? Arrest him, crucify him. How do you do that? The problem is the kind of savior they were looking for. He wasn't the savior they were expecting. They don't know that yet. They know the guy who raised Lazarus from the dead last week. And if that guy can do that, imagine what he can do to Rome. We finally get it back. We have a five-star general. We have an economic powerhouse. The Camelot of David's reign is coming back. And we get to be alive when it happens. Hosanna! Hosanna! Wave the palm branch. They're so excited. Because the Savior has come, they're going to be freed from the tyranny of Rome. But there's one guy who kind of had it in to the reality of who Jesus actually was. I don't think he's actually the Savior that we are hoping for. And so Judas is already plotting in his mind what he's going to do. And they would have just arrested Jesus right then and there but they didn't want to cause a riot in front of everybody who thinks that he's the savior. And so they would give money to anybody who could give them a heads up when things were laying low. If they could just let us know where Jesus is going to be at an opportune time, we can come in. How can so much change in such a short period of time? So much is going to shift Sunday to Sunday. Have you ever had... Man, it's hard to think. Have you ever had something change so drastically in such a short period of time? There was this one time, feels like only three and a half weeks ago, when we were headed to Universal Studios for spring break. 
And then they closed the night before we were leaving. The whole day we were thinking, should we go to Universal Studios for spring break? Should we be around 12,000 people? Like side by side. I kind of, I dig that energy. I, I like having all those people around, generally speaking. Now when I watch a TV show and everybody's at a party, I'm like, oh, you got to get apart from each other. Six feet, six feet. You know, things change quick in a week. The world ran out of toilet paper in a week. It was bizarre. That's how fast things can change. When these defining moments happen in culture, personal life, you can never plan for them. They just happen in the middle of life. That's why it's so important to be faithful moment to moment because you don't know when the moment's going to come where you're going to need that faith. And here we are in the middle of it on Palm Sunday. In Luke chapter 19, verse 39, it also tells the story about Palm Sunday. Right about this point when everybody's crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were ascribing the praise that only belongs to God, to Jesus. And if you are not God, you would better tell them to stop or you're guilty of receiving the praise that only belongs to God. And so some of the Pharisees in Luke chapter 19, verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. What do you think Jesus said? Don't read ahead. What does Jesus say? Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I think this is the emotional tipping point for Jesus. Because he knows where everybody's going to be at in about four or five days. He knows how the mood is going to change. He comes in as king. He'll be crucified as criminal. And this is the moment where you can see they really, they don't get it. This was the last chance. Rebuke your disciples. And Jesus, you just get the exasperation in his voice. In verse 40, he says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Don't you get it? God has to be worshiped. And if you keep your mouth shut, those rocks are going to get a mouth and start singing. That's where we're at. Don't you get it? I have come to save you. Not from Rome, from you. From your own slavery, your own brokenness. Your own thoughts that you can be saved by your goodness. It's over. If you don't get it now, I guess this was, has to happen. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41 and 42. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you even now had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. He says, Jerusalem, you were so close. You were my chosen people. You were literally the city on a hill. And you blew it. I came to save you. And you missed it. I'm right here. The one that you've been waiting for. Since Genesis chapter 3, when all of creation broke. And the curse of sin has been on every human and all of creation has been groaning and viruses come in and earthquakes happen and tornadoes ravage and hurricanes spin. I'm the God who has come to save you from all of that curse. And you look at me and say, rebuke my disciples, Jerusalem, you've missed it. And he weeps. He wasn't going to be the economic savior they wanted. He wasn't going to be the five-star general. 
I don't know what kind of savior you're looking for, but I'll tell you this world is struggling for a savior. And so they try to sing songs of hope, but the song of hope is the most depressing version of hope. You probably heard it last week. There's all these celebrities that came together to sing John Lennon's song, Imagine, which has a beautiful melody. But you watch the video, and if you don't know the song, again, gorgeous melody. First words out of their mouth, out of Wonder Woman's mouth was, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Hold on. Hold on. So, if I heard you right, the song that you're singing to inspire the world in the midst of a pandemic that's killing tens of thousands of people, that has taken over more than a million lives, and you're telling me the song you sing is Imagine There's No Heaven? Hey, you know what we should do? We should sing a song about how there's no afterlife, given that so many people are losing their lives. It's hopeless, and that's the best they've got. There's no hope. This is why there's such an opportunity for the good news of the gospel. I'm telling you, it was such a weird thought that God would allow the churches to be shuttered on Easter, but I'm convinced this message is going to go out. The good news of Jesus has never been as well documented on audio and video for the rest of the world to see as it will be now, because this is all we've got. And there's a world that's desperately in need of hope. Not keep your fingers crossed, and I really, really hope this works out kind of hope, but hope in a historical reality of a real God who really did die and rise from the dead. Did I give away the ending? That's what happens. It's okay. A week later, he's going to rise from the dead. And that's what you want. You want a God who is humble enough to wash the feet of his disciples and powerful enough to rise from the dead, humble enough to die for our sins but not stay dead, have the power to raise us up. That's the God we worship. And that's the beauty. And there's reason to celebrate. I know this whole world, the whole world is in chaos. The whole world knew it when 9-11 happened, but the whole world wasn't affected by it. You know, restaurants didn't shut down. Maybe some for a few days after that, but schools didn't close for months at a time. This is a new world. No, nobody knows where to go or how to maneuver in this except God. And so what's our move? What's the move that you make when no human alive has been through something like this before? Well, we talked on Tuesday night at prayer meeting. We read through Psalm 46. And Psalm 46 begins with God as our refuge and our strength. A very present help in trouble. Don't make the mistake of expecting a Savior that was never promised to you. Jesus has come to save, but he hasn't come to save us from our circumstances. He's come to save us from our sin and God's wrath. He absorbed that wrath for us and gave us his righteousness. In fact, he makes it clear that this world is still going to have problems. He makes it clear John chapter 16, he says, In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Those two things can both exist. You can still have troubles while God has still overcome the world. Because, listen, whether it happens because of this, or if it happens for the same reason why things people were passing away two months ago, you know, heart disease and cancer are still 
ahead of COVID-19 on the leading causes of death in America as of tonight. But the same God who said you will have trouble in this world, he's already overcome this world. There's life on the other side of this circumstance that is hope, that can matter eternally. And that's what matters. If our hope isn't in him, it doesn't really matter whether it's this situation or the one you brought into this situation with you that's causing you anxiety and stress and makes you give back into your addictions, makes you fall back into the same old patterns. All those things are still there. The only hope that was true two months ago, 2,000 years ago, and today is the same. It's only Jesus. He is still our refuge and our strength. And that's only true because of when he walked in on Palm Sunday, he knew what he was walking into. And when we know the reality of Easter, we can do Psalm 46, verse 11. We can be still and know that he's God. We can Proverbs chapter 3. We can trust in the Lord with all our heart and not lean on our own understanding. That's what it looks like. To trust God isn't doesn't mean you don't go out and get the resources you need to take care of your family and to take care of your neighbors. That's what love looks like in this situation. But it doesn't mean you freak out trying to control everything. We never really had control. It's always been him. So we say, God, what do you have for me today? I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. What do you have for me today? Jesus has come to save. That's true of you. It's true of me. That's our hope. We don't have hope in something else. When he goes in to the city, they may have been waving their palm fronds, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Many of them didn't have the right idea in mind. But Jesus knew what that actually meant. He was about, about to fulfill a prophecy that they didn't even realize. And it would mean more than they could ever hope. The same is true today. Put your hope in Jesus. He's the one who has come to save. He's the only hope we have. Virus or no virus. Now, 10 years from now, he's our only hope. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for being our source of strength. Thank you for being our hope. Thank you that you meet us in your omnipresence wherever we sit right now, that we can trust in the God who is here. We can trust in a God who draws near to us when we are brokenhearted, when we're afraid, when we're lonely, when we don't know what to do next, when we don't know how to do what we're supposed to do next. We can be still and know that you are God because you are the one who comes to save. Hosanna, save us, please. Save us now. Amen. Hi, church. Hey, church. Hey, church. Hey, church. Love, Hi, you. Love, love you. Love you. Good seeing you.